And uh, turn to the book of Jude. Jude. And if you want to know what chapter, uh, just go ahead and just bow your head now because it's going to be bad. <laughs> Amen. Jude. Amen. One chapter book, just a very small book, 25 short verses. But I got to looking, and uh, it's probably going to take about 13 weeks to cover this. It is just amazing, if I can get it done that fast. Uh, there is so much in here, and uh, it's going to be very, 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 very enjoyable. I uh, meant to put up the whiteboard and put my outline on it for you. I'll make it where it's easier for you. But anyway, last week, we, I think this is the third week, I think, we had an introduction one week, and then last week we dealt with verses 1 and 2, and we talked about the position of a disciple, the position, we're servants, amen, so I dealt with that last week, I want to encourage you to get that, some good stuff in that, but this week we're going to be dealing with number 2 in your outline, Roman numeral 2, we're going to be dealing with the purpose for diligence. The purpose for diligence. Now, let's go ahead and look at verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who, are, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in this section, we're going to see the purpose for Jude, for his epistle, for Jude's epistle. I'm sorry about that. I had to switch phones because I was in that group that got cut off. But anyway, I've gotten on silent now. But anyway, in this, in this section, we're going to see the purpose of Jude's epistle. Uh, we, we see there in verse 3 that he's writing to them. And he, he said he gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. He wanted to write about salvation. He wanted to write to them about uh, the gospel and about getting saved. But notice something here. He says... Uh, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. He, he found something that was more important at that time to discuss. What could be more important than salvation? Contending for the faith. Contending for the faith. We're going to look at that this morning. I'm going to give you three things uh, this morning about the purpose for diligence. And first of all is going to be the common salvation uh, when he's writing the saints and again he is writing to saints look at verse 1 Jude the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to them that are sanctified by God the Father is that you? Uh, yeah and preserved are you sealed to the day of redemption? are you preserved? yep that's you and called amen so he's writing to to, to believers, he's writing to believers, and he was writing about salvation and found it more needful to exhort. Notice his purpose is stated, he's writing to exhort you to contend for the faith. What does exhort mean? It means to encourage, to excite, or to embolden. He wanted to encourage you, embolden you, excite you to action. And what action was he wanting? You contending for the faith. Contend for the faith. Why? Verse 4. Uh, for there are certain men crept in unawares who before old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of the false prophets, the false preachers, the false teachers that had entered in, they crept into, they snuck into the flock like wolves in sheep's clothing. 
They come in wearing a suit and tie, carrying a King James Bible under their arm, but they don't believe a word of it. That's the way they are. They don't come in. The devil don't come into a church with a red jumpsuit, horns, and a pitchfork. That's too obvious. He comes in wearing a three-piece suit, everything polished and shined, carrying the King James Bible. That's how he's going to come in. He's going to come in and try to deceive you. Uh, what, what, was, what was the problem? What was going on? There they were denying the Lord and causing people to turn from the grace of God to lasciviousness, to lusting after things. They were denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They were denying the deity of Christ, who he is. You know, Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. I've said a lot of times, you, you can find out real quick who believes the Bible and who don't. Just find out what they believe about Jesus Christ. If they're off on Jesus Christ, their doctrine is no good. If you don't have Jesus right, nothing else is going to be right. And that's, that's a good way to look at it. Jehovah Witnesses, what do they believe about Jesus Christ? They don't believe he's uh, God manifest in the flesh. They don't believe in the Trinity. They don't believe that. So their doctrine is off. They don't even believe in hell before. So you see what I'm saying? The Mormons, what do they believe? They believe he's the brother of the devil. They are brothers. They were both created beings. You, you see what I'm saying? So if they're off on Jesus Christ. They're going to be off on everything else. But anyway, let's take a closer look at this common salvation. Uh, he called it common salvation because it was common for both the Gentile and the Jew. Remember in the early church, the Jews didn't believe that the Gentiles could be reconciled to God or could have a relationship with God. They believed the Gentiles to be dogs. They were the only ones that could be right with God. They was the only one who could have a relationship with God and they denied that the Gentiles could be part of the church, you know what I'm saying. Uh, but here's the problem. There's only one door. That's right. You know, uh, there's only one door and the only way in is through the blood of Jesus Christ. There's only one way of salvation. Uh, Jesus said, I am the door. You think about Noah's Ark, a picture of of the Lord Jesus Christ, the picture, a picture of salvation, there was only one door. There wasn't multiple doors. There wasn't a right. door for the snails and a door for the giraffes. There wasn't a door for, you know, something skinny or something big like an elephant. No, no. There was one door. And Jesus mm -hmm. said, I am the door. There's only one way. And Jesus said, I am the way. Today, people believe if you're sincere, if they're really sincere, then, 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 then God will let them in. Then, you know, if they're really sincere, they'll, they'll make it to heaven. The problem is, Jesus said, no man cometh to the Father but by me. He is the only way. There isn't a Buddhist way, a Muslim way, a Hindu way. There isn't a Baptist way or a Catholic way or holiness way. There isn't a Presbyterian way. There's one way. Jesus Christ. We go, everybody gets saved the same way. It's a common salvation. Now, let me show you that. Look at Acts 4. Hold your place there, but look at Acts 4. <clears throat> Acts 4, verse 12. Most of you knew probably where I was going as soon as I said Acts 4. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What name is that? It's not Buddha, it's not Allah, it's not Confucius. It's Jesus. Amen? Jesus is the way. Uh, turn on over to Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3. We're all 
saved the same way today is a common salvation for both the Jew and the Gentile. Their traditions, their holy days, their, their, their sacrifices, their traditions will not save them. They must get saved just like we do today. Uh, and once we're saved, we're in the church. Amen. There's neither Jew nor Gentile in the church. Look at verse 28. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So there's a common salvation that puts us into the church together. Amen. Uh, Paul speaks of the common salvation in Titus 1 4. And again, in the early church, there were still those who denied that the Gentiles could be reconciled to God. They were dogs. And I want you to see that. Uh, turn to Acts chapter 15. In Acts 15, now this is interesting. It's going to get interesting here in a minute, but we're going through some, some, of, the, some of the stuff that we need to learn too. <coughs> Acts 15, look at verse 11. Now, the early church was fussing about the Gentiles being witnessed to. Paul was taking the gospel to the Gentiles and they, someone wasn't liking that. Because remember, when Jesus was here, he said, go you not in the way of the Gentiles. He says, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So here's Paul wanting to go to the Gentiles. So the early church, uh, there was some problems, but here they have a meeting and look what, Look what the conclusion is in verse 11. But we, there's the Jews. You can read it and get the context and find out that's the Jews. But we believe through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they, the Gentiles. They, they have to turn their back on the law, turn their back on their tradition, turn their back on their sacrifices and all the things that they were depending on then. They had to turn their back on that and accept the Lord Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That's how they get saved, by faith. Not the works anymore, amen? They were going from law to grace. Uh, so the early church, in the early church, there were Jews who rejected Jesus Christ. And that's what we see at the end of verse 4 and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, it was the Jews, <coughs> the religious leaders actually, of the Jews, who were, who, who were work whipping the crowd up and getting the crowd to cry out, crucify him. It was the religious crowd. Uh, we'll, we'll get some more of that this, uh, in the preaching hour. But anyway... Uh, I didn't deal with it, but there's three points that I have under the common salvation. First, the lost. We're all born lost uh, in need of a Savior. Jews are born lost in need of a Savior just because the Bible calls them the elect or, or they're referred to as the apple of his eye. His chosen people, it does not mean they do not need salvation just as we do. They're born with the same sinful nature, headed for the same hell as we are, unless they put their individual, personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They have to accept the Lord just like anyone else. Amen? Uh, so the lost. And then the Lord, of course, He died for all. He didn't die just for the Jew. He didn't die just for the Gentile. He didn't die just for those who were predetermined. I'm no Calvinist. The Bible says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, let's see here. What did John the Baptist say? Behold the Lamb of God. He didn't say behold a Lamb of God. A as in many. A as in one of many. He said behold the singular as the one and only. Lamb of God. Amen. Jesus is the only way. There's no other way. 
So you have the lost, the Lord, and of course the love. You can talk about John 3, 16, God loving the world and gave his only begotten son, of course, and uh, talk about how he willingly laid down his life for us. Number two, number one, again, was the common salvation. Now, number two, we're going to be dealing with the contending. Look at verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Earnestly contend for the faith. Contend means to strive, to struggle, to fight for. We should, we should struggle, we should fight for the faith. Amen? That, it's almost like a... Uh, a contest or, or, or a debate, you, you should contend for the faith. We're living in a day and age now where everybody talks about tolerance. Tolerance. Uh, the problem is everybody's tolerant of sin, but no one's tolerant of truth today. Uh, I was reading uh, some news article and it was uh, some, some, some university said uh, their, their dean or whatever got up and made a speech and said that they would not tolerate intolerance. It was a lady. She got up there and she emphasized to the new coming uh, students that they would not tolerate, absolutely would not tolerate intolerance. Inside of me is a, you know, we've been talking about the two natures of the believer. On Wednesday night, and inside of me is is, is little Jimmy, <laughs> and I even wonder if he's saved sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and little Jimmy just rose up at me real quick and hopped out, and he was saying that he was say, he was over there saying, "Boy, I wish I was there. My hand would be going up." I say, "Is not the very statement you made the definition of intolerance?" We will not tolerate intolerance. <laughs> How asinine and backwards is that? Right. This, this world is just crazy. Yeah. They really have lost their mind. Just because something sounds good doesn't mean it's smart at all. Right. Right. But anyway, contend for the faith is what we're talking about. He said earnestly contend. Earnestly means eagerly, excitedly energetically we should contend for the faith are you contending for the faith That's right. Amen. do you contend for the faith in your family yep. do you stand up for the truth when when family's going wrong or going the wrong direction do you stand up for truth when they talk about sin and life and brag about sin do you contend for it at family gatherings do you contend for it at work when they come in bragging about how they've drank all weekend or how they've sinned or done this or partied all weekend. <coughs> do you contend for the faith when they try to pull you in? Amen? Yes. Contend for the faith. Uh, what faith? What faith is he talking about there? Notice he says contend for the faith. What faith? Turn to 1 Corinthians. Fifteen. Notice it said, contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Which was once delivered unto the saints. So here's the faith that we're to contend for. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 3. For I deliver unto you first of all that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. That's what he's talking about. Contend for the faith. The death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The deity of Christ. The incarnation. The virgin birth. I mean, we should contend for the truths of the gospel. Amen. There is a Christian... Uh, 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 the word just left me. I know I'm talking about apologetics. There's a Christian discipline, that's it, 
that is uh, in the study of the Word of God called apologetics. And what it is, it's, it's learning to defend the faith. Apologetics is learning to defend the faith. And one of these days, I would love to teach a class on apologetics. The only problem is, uh, apologetics is very interesting to me. I love it. But, but it. but if you're not one that likes to study, that would be a boring class. Because you are learning how to defend there is a God. He created everything. And He's the Savior of us all. Amen. If you're saved, He's going to be the Savior. You're defending what you believe. But the first thing you have to, the first thing this question is, how do you know there's a God? How do you know God created anything? You, you see what I mean? To be able to answer that without just relying on Scripture. See, my faith is not a blind faith. I'm not just blindly following what I've been taught. I mean, I do study it, and I think that we ought to be uh, able to give an answer to every man according to the hope that's in us. Amen? That's what the Bible says that we should be able to do, and we should be prepared. Uh, Lord willing, I, I may do a, a something on that one of these days, try to find a way not to get in, to drag you through the mud so long. Amen? Because you get into some scientific arguments, you, you get into the cosmos and all kinds of science, which I like. I like that stuff. Uh, I, I, li I mean, to me, it's like reading a funny paper. Amen? A hundred million billion years ago. You know, I'm thinking, okay, here we go. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's getting good right from the get-go, amen? But anyway, uh, we're to contend for the faith. The Christian life is likened to a warfare. You can find that in 1 Timothy 1.18. Uh, it's likened to a battle, 1 Corinthians 14. The Christian is called a soldier, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3. We are told to put on the whole armor of God. Again, reference to us being in a warfare. This Christian life is not supposed to be a life that where we just sit down in, in leisure and just look for pleasure. It's supposed to be a battle. Are you battling? Are you fighting for the faith? Are you contending for the faith? Yes, or are you just riding the pew? I mean, basically. That's what a lot of Christians do today. We're to contend for the faith. I'm going to give you a couple of things about that. Contending. First, the requirement. Notice, he earnestly exhorts you to contend. It is a requirement of us all. It's a requirement. It's a requirement of us all. Not just the preachers. Everybody thinks, well, it's the preacher's job. The preacher should contend for the faith. It's the preacher that should defend the faith. No, it's the Christian. Who's he writing to? He is writing to those who are saved and sanctified and preserved. He's, he's writing to believers. That's you. That's me. We should be contending for the faith. Uh, so that's a requirement. Now, the reasons. I'm going to give you about five reasons. The reasons. So A is requirement. B is reasons. And then under it, you're going to have five things listed. First of all, it's a command of the Savior. You know, he when he ascended up, he, he said to go into the highway, wait a minute, he said to go into all the world and preach the gospel, didn't he? Most people remember the Great Commission. You can go to Acts 1-8 and you can get ours. We're, we're, to take, we're to take the gospel to the world. Yeah. So we have the command of the Savior. To do it. That alone should be enough. I shouldn't even need two, three, four, five. That alone should be enough to get us all studying and preparing and contending and witnessing. Amen? That alone. Just the Lord commanded it. But secondly, how about this one? The, con the condemnation of sinners. If 
the lost die without the Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to hell. Right. That's your lost loved ones, your lost co-workers, your lost neighbors, your lost friends, your lost family. Right. If they die without Jesus Christ, they're going to hell. That should motivate you. Right. That should cause you and stir you and make you want to contend for the faith. Mm. In fact, we're told to compel them to come in. Luke yeah. 14. Go in the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be yeah. full. That's in Luke 14. How about number three? How about the compromising of saints? You have the command of the Savior, the condemnation of the sinner, and the compromising of the saints. Looking around and seeing that Christians live like the world, sin like the world, look like the world, sound like the world. You know, you can't tell the difference between Christian and the world anymore. It used to be you could. Their speech was different. Their dress was different. They were different. Their music was different. Where they went, their entertainment was different. Not today. You can't tell the difference between uh, the, the world and the church anymore. There used to be a gap, a gulf fixed between them. But now they're so intermingled and blurred you can't tell who's who. That should be enough to make you want to contend for the faith. Amen. How about number four? The corruption of the scriptures. I got saved and... Uh, June 9th, 1992, and from that time, I've, I've tried my best. I've not been perfect. I've failed. I'm a miserable excuse, pitiful excuse of a Christian. But the Lord's been good to me, and He spoke to me through these scriptures, and He's helped me, and I've tried to guide my family and raise my family by the scriptures. I've been blessed because of that, and I know that, and, and this book is precious to me. And it seems like almost every year they're coming out with a new version. They're perverting the Word of God and, and, sure. and seeing how they're twisting and perverting the Word of God. That should anger you enough yeah. to make you want to contend for the faith. Amen. Do you know, I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. Amen. Amen. You, know what, you know what the world's done? They've come out with the Queen James Bible. <coughs> They took eight verses in the King James Bible dealing with homosexuality and reworded them so that homosexuality no longer looks like a sin. And they called it the Queen James Bible. I'm not lying to you. You can look it up. You can Google the Queen James Bible in Bible if you want it. I would suggest giving them a pity for that feel. You know, the Bible says, well, if they only changed eight verses... A little leaven, leaven is the whole lump. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. They, they perverted the word of God. And, and we need to, and I'm contending for the faith right now by pointing that out. You know what I mean? When you hear someone bring up another Bible, say, what's so special about it? Oh, it's easy to read. They're lying through their teeth. They're just quoting what somebody else said. Yeah. The truth of the matter, the, the King James Bible is the easiest to read. Amen. It just don't read like the newspaper or, or, your, or your magazines. It reads different. Why? Because it is different. It's the Word of God. Amen. 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 I don't want it to sound like Newsweek or, 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 or Field and Stream or, or, or Cosmopolitan or whatever. You know what I mean? I want it to sound different. I want it to be different. Ain't it funny they say they got to get rid of the old archaic words, but they've never messed with Shakespeare? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. How come they haven't updated Shakespeare? See, it ain't, it ain't the words. It's the author they're trying to get rid of. That's interesting. All right, the command of the Savior, the condemning of the sinner, the compromising of the saints, the corruption of the Scripture, and then fifthly, the, the, the contamination of society. Society as a whole 
it is, it, it, it just blows my mind. I'm 52 years old. I'm not very old yet. I'm still a whippersnapper. Some of you think, boy, that's old. Yeah, yeah, I can feel it, but it ain't, it ain't, it ain't old yet. It ain't old yet, and I know that. But, but just in my short time, it just blows my mind how rapidly sin has embra been embraced in this country. All through my childhood and my teen years, life stayed the same. And into my early twenties and thirties, and then began to around. Uh, 40, around 40, about 12, 15 years ago, somewhere in that range, I mean, it just started like it started picking up speed. Homosexuality, they came out of the closet. Now, they're not just out of the closet. They've got laws to protect them. It seems like every TV show or every game show or anything, they've got to put some queer faggot in your face. They, they're flaunting it. Yeah. now and pushing it it's not enough just to tolerate it you've got to embrace it yeah that's what they're pushing it has gone so far beyond we we are we are our society is so perverted that even our leaders are messed up in the head yep. <laughs> we have a supreme court justice that is retiring our president is going to get to pick a Supreme Court Justice. That is a life tenure. They are placed in there and they serve for life. As long as they desire and they don't mess up and get impeached, they hold that position. It is a very important position. Someone very skilled, knowledgeable, and qualified should be there. Our president gets on the TV and he says, I'm looking for a black woman to fill that position. He just broke the law. He just broke the law. There's laws against discrimination. He just discriminated against every white man, every white male, every Hispanic male who wants that position is more qualified maybe than a, the black woman, he don't stand a chance. Now you run a business and you get up and you say, I'm looking for a white male to do this position, they'll throw you under the bus for discrimination. But he just did it. And that's the very definition of racism. How would you like to get a job just because of the color of your skin? Not because you're qualified, not because you earned it, but because of the color of your skin. This country's lost its mind. And there'd be people get upset and call me a racist, and I'll just tell them, shut up, you're a fool. You're a fool if you believe like that. That is so messed up. That's what's wrong with society today. They don't think. I don't care if they're black, white, Hispanic, it doesn't matter to me. I want the one that's the best, the brightest, the most qualified. Amen. That's what matters, you see. But no one's contending for truth. No one's contending. And Christians, we ought to contend for the faith. We ought not sit right. back and just let them bull run us over and tell us to sit down and shut up, keep it in the church. You know what I mean? No, no, no. We should be contending for the faith. So we talked about the requirement. I gave you five reasons. Now the rewards. Do you know uh, when we get to the judgment seat of Christ... The Lord's going to reward us. And I think He's going to be looking at how we contend for the faith as well. Not just the souls we won, but how we stood for truth and how we stood up against lies in society and in our surroundings. We're blessed now for serving the Lord. We get His blessings on our life now. We serve the Lord and He blesses us and He's good to us. Amen. But He's going to give us eternal rewards when we get to heaven as well. Now, I said we was going to look at three things this morning. We looked at the common salvation. We looked a little bit about contending for the faith. And the third thing is the condemnation. There it said that there were, for certain men have crept in unawares. Crept in. They used deception. Wolves in sheep's clothing. They tried to get in unnoticed, undetected. 
They try to come in under the radar, if you would. Their tactics and their teaching, both, is condemned. They're turning people from the grace of God to lusting, lasciviousness, lusting after evil and wicked things in their wicked ways. There's a couple of things. I'm quickly running out of time, but let me give you a couple of things. First thing, or, or A in your outline, would be the false hope. These, these wolves, if you would, these false prophets, these apostates that creep in and try to lead people astray, they, uh, hmm, trying to see what I can put in, what I, what, what I believe. They try to add something to what, they try to add something to salvation usually. We're, we're living in a day and age where they come in with their false doctrine and their false teaching. They usually come in, they're trying to pull away people to follow them. That's usually what they're doing. They, they come in and they, they, they think they know more than everybody else and, 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 and they're smarter than everybody else and, and they try to get a following for themselves is usually what they're doing. Now, and, and a lot of times they give a false hope by adding something, some kind of works to salvation. For instance, uh, believe and be baptized for the remissions of sin. See, faith is all you need to be saved in this dispensation. We're saved by grace through faith. Amen? We put our faith, it's God's grace that any of us are saved, but it's when we put our faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, we're saved. If they try to add baptism or church membership or the Ten Commandments or anything else to it, it's a work. Yeah. It's a work. See, what he did is not enough. I've got to do something. And why do I have to do something? So I can look good. Look what I did. So I can brag. I can boast on, look what I did. I did this. No, we didn't. We didn't do any of it. Jesus did it all. In fact, he said it's finished before he died on the cross. He completed everything. They give a false hope. And a lot of people, a lot of people believe they're going to heaven on their own pretense, on their own works, by their own hand. A lot of times they believe they're the only ones right with God to do. Now, I, I, I'm no spring, I, I'm no old person, but I'm no spring chicken either. I've been in it long enough. I've seen, I've seen them blow in and blow out of churches, and they come in, and they think they're the only ones right with God. They think everybody else needs to get right with God. They're the only one right with God. And usually, they're not faithful. Usually, they blow in and out. Usually, they stir up trouble. I mean, seriously, that's usually those that come in, and they try to give you a false hope. Uh, they, they try to, they say, if you follow me, you, you'll be right with God. I, I've told you before, I love this church. I think it is the best church, amen? But we're not the only church with the truth. You remember poor old Elijah? He come out, woes me, I'm the only one serving you, Lord. Yeah. The Lord says, shut up, I got 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Just because you don't know them don't mean anything. He knows them. He knows who they are and where they are. Amen. But anyway, a lot of times they, 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 these false teachers, and uh, uh, they'll come in and they'll come in and make you think the only way to get right with God is to follow them, to do what they're doing, to believe what they believe. They're the only one right with God. They're the only one with the truth. That's usually the ones you better watch out for. That's the ones that will get you if you're not careful. And then the, uh, the last thing I'll point out here is the fiery hell. The false hope and the fiery hell. Uh, notice at the end it says, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Some even deny hell's real, Jehovah Witnesses. Or they water it down. It's just the absence from God. 
It's to be out of the presence of God, absent the presence of God. Uh, yeah, that's true. It is absent His presence in a sense. Uh, but there's a verse in the Bible that says, if I make my bed in hell, thou art there. So really, you are in His presence. Yeah. It's just not the presence you want to be in. You're in His wrath. In His wrath. And His wrath is literal flame. Amen. Hell's fire is real. But anyway, uh, they deny the Lord. And uh, to deny the Lord is to seal your faith in hell. <clears throat> to deny the Lord. He's the one that saved you. There's no other way. We've done seen that. There's no other name. There's no other door. There's no other way. It's that through Jesus Christ. That's right. And to, to deny Jesus Christ is to seal your fate in hell. That's just point blank blunt as I can put it. But it's a fact. And you know what this world needs to hear? They need to hear there ain't but one Jesus Christ. I don't care what Oprah says. Oprah was on TV and somebody's uh, witnessing and talking to him asked a question. She didn't agree with him. That's not my Jesus. I don't know who your Jesus is, but mine's the Jesus of the Bible. And he ain't the same one the world talks about. Amen. Amen. So Oprah and the world have one Jesus. The Bible tells of another one. Anybody that tries to deny the deity of Jesus Christ is a false prophet. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. And to try to put the God of the Old Testament against Jesus of the New Testament and say they're different, there's something wrong with them. God's all, Jesus is all love and he'd never do anything. Well, that Old Testament God was a God of wrath. He would say, go in and kill them all, men, women, children, kill the animals even. Don't let anything live. But that's not Jesus of the New Testament. Oh, yes, that's the same thing. That's the same one. The same one that was so angry with his people that he allowed judgment on them is the same one that died on the cross for you. Amen. Amen. And the same one's going to judge you one day. That's the same God. Yes, sir. Ain't but one. But anyway, we need to contend for the faith. We have a common salvation. All right, any questions there? I'm, I'm done. I'm out of time. Any questions? You can't contend for anything that you don't know. Amen. Boom. That's it. You can't contend for anything you don't study. You need to study so you can be ready to give an answer. Amen. All right. Lord willing, we're getting into the interesting stuff next week. We're going to start it next week. It's going to, he's going to start giving examples of some of these ungodly men, these false prophets that have entered in unaware. He's going to start giving examples. So we'll start dealing with them next week. If you want to read ahead, go ahead and read ahead. All right. <coughs> Father, Lord, do want to thank you for this. Uh, opportunity to open your word. Pray, Lord, that you just uh, use it now, Lord, to help us prepare our hearts, Lord, for the message. Be with Brother Ryan as he preaches. Be with the choirs they sang. And Father, just fill me with your spirit. Use me during the preaching hour as well. And we, we'll praise you and thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.